I think it's a, a wonderful time to be part of the art world. 19 years into the 21st century, all sorts of changes seem to be afoot for artists, for curators and dealers, and for those of us who regularly visit museums and galleries. Art is now viewed as a global enterprise. There are lots of new names and images to discover. Issues of gender are less skewed. Art dealing has become a business more on the par with corporate practices than mom and pop shops. And new museum buildings offer myriad challenges. While there are many more genres to reckon with, just think about how the quality and quantity of performance art has exploded. Painting and sculpture remain a matter of abstraction and representation and all points in between. As I said at the studio school last year, abstract art hasn't been this exciting since the 1960s. The same can be said for figurative art, which lately has returned to a more mainstream existence. And then there are those artists who work in the gap between art and life. They make us aware of color, composition, facture, and scale, as well as offer fleeting glimpses of the world around us homages to old masters and painters of the recent past, current events, and history itself, intimate moments, tumult, disaster, joy. When I walked into Cecily Brown's show at Paula Cooper two years ago, I was awestruck. The audaciously sized paintings had imagery that was embedded in astonishingly rhythmic passages of color. The work grabbed you from afar and then forced you to get up close to look at every metaphorical nook and cranny. Initially, I thought, wow, this is a new species of peekaboo abstraction. With the passing of time, I've, begu I've begun to wonder whether in the future we're going to be more engaged by her representational imagery. Maybe it's not a matter of abstraction versus representation. Perhaps it's a question of emotion and feeling versus storytelling. After all, these are not portraits of people. They are men and women who are doing something purposefully. They are active, not passive. They are nouns linked to verbs. Still. When push comes to shove, when we face a painting or a drawing or a print by Cecily Brown, we're experiencing a work of art of great beauty and majesty. So it wasn't in the introduction. It's kind of intriguing that you did, for six months, come to the studio school. Yeah, that's right. I don't know if this is working, actually. When I click, flicked it, nothing happened. But I'm quite loud. I can just be loud, if you want. Um, does someone want to do something, or is it OK? OK, okay. I won't be too loud. OK, um, yeah, I spent six months here in 1992. Um, I was a student at the Slade School um, in London, which I just heard there are two Sladies here tonight. Um, so, oh, three. Yeah, because the Slade had a four-year degree course. Most of the uh, London schools had three-year courses. So by the third year, one was quite restless. And um, I'd spent three years getting into art school anyway, so I was sort of used to working on my own and um, you know, anxious to sort of spread my wings a bit. This was undergrad. And um, when I heard you could go away for six months in your third year, I wanted to do that. And a boy in the year above me, Andrew Sito, had come here and you know, just said you would love it so much. And so um, I asked the Slade, I said I'd like to go to New York and the studio school was the place they told me, you know, this, we did an exchange. Um, so uh, yeah, I came here I mean, when 92 
I didn't want to go back to England. I remember faxing my professor saying, can I just finish my degree from New York? And um, he said no, and I had to <laughs> go back. And so I then had one more year at the Slade, and then all I wanted to do from then on was to get back to New York one way or another. So n studio school was um, really my introduction to New York. Why did you want to come back to New York? <laughs> I mean, it was 93, 4, so New York was really badass and exciting, and, you know, London seemed very provincial in comparison. Um, New York just was, I mean, the things that haven't changed about New York, you know, I mean, the city, I was very excited by the physical side of New York, like the light and the, just the geography and the... You know, I loved it as a city, and if you're from London, or s London's so sprawling that Manhattan was this joy because everything's so close together, and um, I still like all that about it. I don't want to be too negative tonight, <laughs> but A, I'm going to argue with you that it is not a good time in the art world, and B, I think it's an absolutely horrible time in New York. So, you know, it turns out 25 years have passed by, and I'm here, and it's become my home, I mean, deeply so, as I have a family here. But, um, you know, it's kind of weird coming back tonight. I haven't actually been in this building since, but just remember it, this is this big span of coming here and New York, were, and I really try hard not to hark on about the past, harp on about the past, but I miss the old New York and just, it was just, uh, I was 24, 25, it was so exciting, so alive. Um, and not full of rich people um, to the extent that it is now. Um, I hate to spoil it for people who are young now because I know if you're young, you'll always find your own New York and the beauty of New York that, is, that it always changes and so on and so forth. But I do, I would not move here now if I probably wouldn't even be interested in coming here now. Well. Anyway, sorry, that was a very long answer. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't leave. Well, there's nowhere else to go, that's the question. Where else? <laughs> no, but seriously, I mean, London's a disaster. <laughs> Nearly everywhere in Europe is a mess. I mean, it's very hard to think where else would one be. And then because of my circumstances, I have a loving husband and a child here now. So, I mean, my life's here, but it's, it's not a good moment, in my opinion. But anyway, just to start on a cheerful note. <laughs> no, I, I, really, I really feel that we are finally deep into the new century and things are happening. Yeah. Um, interesting. I mean, it, it's an okay moment in the art world in that it's quite exciting that so many people seem to care about art now. But there's, you know, because there's so much money um, you know, it's a rather jaded art world and it's hard to figure out who really cares, you know. And I'm lucky enough to have been at art school at a time when nobody expected to make a living from being an artist. So I almost think of myself as the last pure generation, even though I've ended up being extremely fortunate that I do man get to do that and paint for a living. But, um, you know, when I was at the Slade, we were basically given one talk about being in the world, which was, well, obviously you won't support yourselves as artists, so this, these are the ways you sign on the doll or become a teacher or whatever it is, but, you know, if you want to be an artist, you'll probably have to find another way to support yourself. And I'm actually feel very, I feel very fortunate that I was around at that time because you really had to prove to yourself that you would do it, like, no matter what. So I am a sort of romantic, and I think that started then because you really felt, well, if I want to be an artist, it won't be easy, I won't have any money, and I just want to do it because that's all I want to do. Well, I was very surprised in reading about uh, the mural that's, that's been on the screen the, the, at the Metropolitan Opera House, and we're beginning with it because I, I, I hope all of you have seen it. If you haven't, you can go to the Metropolitan Opera House and see it during the week, or um, there is uh, on Sundays when they're not performing. Um, I was very surprised that they approached you, but it wasn't a commission. Right. No, well, um, 
you know, Dodi Kajantian has run this thing at the Met for some years at the Opera House that's called Gallery Met, where she's invited contemporary artists to do shows there. Um, but that gallery was closing down temporarily, and so she decided to invite people to do works within the Opera House itself. Um, so it's just like luck and timing, like most things, um, that she approached me She'd just seen my show at Paula Cooper and these very large-scale paintings. And not all my work is large-scale, but I'd d just done these m mega paintings. And I think she thought doing something of that scale would look really fabulous at the Opera House. And just, if you haven't seen it, um, the red at the bottom, it looks very strange here, but that's the carpet of the Opera House. So... Um, but it was a big departure for me because it was really the first time that I've ever made a work that where I knew, when it, where I knew where it was going to go, and n made it knowing where it would end up. Um, w were the paintings at Paula Cooper this 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 long? Yeah. So there was there was one at Paula's that was this long, but it was uh, in three parts, and up until this one, I'd always made with my really big works, they'd always been diptychs or triptychs. So this was the first single canvas that was this big. But it's more or less the same proportions, I think, as the Paula Cooper painting. And when you, uh, one is predominantly yellow, this one, and then there's another that's predominantly red. Were you thinking about the Marc Chagall's? Yeah. Um, if you haven't been there, there's two enormous Marc Chagall's on either side um, that you can see from the street. Um, and the colors, the palette is basically yellow and red, and I realized I'd have to, so this painting sort of sits in between them, um, so I, I knew I'd have to sort of take on the Chagall's, and also the whole uh, colors of the interior, it's all very red and gold, it's this sort of very decadent colored interior, so um, red and gold kind of seem like the only way to go. We should have really got a picture of the top one as well, shouldn't we, but oh well. But um, yeah, this one's much more, the other one's more linear and a bit more like a drawing, which was basically because in my studio there wasn't, this only just fit in my studio, but I worked on them both at the same time. The other one was on the opposite side and it was harder to work on that side with bring my ladders and all my buckets and things over. So it ended up being, oh, there it is. Yeah. You did get it, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, so this I feel is much more linear, but I really like the idea of them as a pair, and that they were quite different from one another. And, I mean, just just to go back to Marc Chagall for a moment, I mean, he's not as highly regarded today as he once was. Yeah, I'm was. not a fan. You are, you're not. No. no. Okay. <laughs> Approaching making these works, um, did you have particular themes in mind? Were you thinking about operas or music or the audience? Or did you already have the title Triumph of the Vanities in, in, your, in your mind? No, I didn't have the title till the end. And, um, but yeah, so, you know, I've, I've, I'm sure we talked about this when you came to the studio, but I've always had this sort of moral thing of never working for a show, a gallery show or any show, but I always just work and um, then pick later what's, not only what's going into the show, but usually also when the show is. So I don't really, I'm, I can't work, to, I don't like deadlines and I don't say, this is for London, this is for Paris, this is whatever. So I tend to just sort of, my, it's most productive for me to sort of just pretend there is no show and no one's going to be seeing anything and sort of paint away as if I am still 18 and nobody cares and then later and also because I like being quite prolific but then editing so that way I can just make lots of work and then later decide what should go into the exhibition so this was a huge and that's been a rule of mine for 20 years so I completely broke my rule with this and I'm breaking it again right now actually um, because maybe this was an is a new thing but the reason I said yes to this was because as soon as Dodi asked if I would do it, I could almost picture these. I, I knew straight away what they should look like. I mean, not in terms of as, the, as a whole thing, but I knew what the imagery should be and the colors. And I wanted them to be sort of uh, like a cocktail party at the end of the world. Um, so I was very aware that 
what the place would look like when it was full of people, and that it's often full of people with their finery and sort of bare shoulders and bow ties and furs and done up people, and you know, and lots of crisscrossing legs coming down the stairs and all that, and this kind of swooping architecture. So I just I said yes because I kind of knew I had a not a vision, but I knew what I wanted to do straight away, and I. I just love the idea that these cr they would normally be seen with a crowd in front of them. And I also knew that people would be taking selfies in front of them a lot, for better or worse. So a lot of the figures are actually holding phones, although it ends up being this sort of classical gesture that you can't necessarily tell they're holding a phone. But this kind of thing is repeated a lot. And in fact, if you go to the opera, that's all you see is people selfieing in front of it, if that's a word. Um, but it just seemed sort of made all the things that, you know, I love piling up figures and space and I love a crowd of figures and, you know, things that are constantly in motion. So, um, oh yeah, and then I um, read a bit about Lincoln Center and um, the history and the fact that, you know, all, whole neighborhoods had been raised um, to make space for Lincoln Center and um, I kind of like the idea of having these crowds of figures that were sort of ambiguous whether they were part of the party or they were being ousted for the party or whatever it was. But I mean, I think my work's always ambiguous. You say telling a story, but it's always sort of trying, these are trying to tell many stories at the same time. And then of course I did think about, I think I, they're more theatrical than usual, which I really loved doing because I knew, I was thinking of the fact that people would be coming out from, they'd have just seen some extraordinary thing on stage and then would be coming out and having a drink and this thing, you know, that while they're sort of, um, um, what do you call it? Taking in and mulling over what they'd just seen, um, that they would see fragments on, in the painting that, um, that there's a drama and theatricality to it, but it's sort of, life drama, not just the stage, but I think having it in this theatrical setting was very uh, exciting and freeing for me. And I, I was recently reading something about another artist who has worked really on, on, on long paintings, and, and, and the commentator was trying to say that you see section A, but by the time you get to section D, you have forgotten section mm -hmm. A. Right. Can, can you relate to that? It was, it was... I mean, I think it's one of the reasons it's so much easier working on this scale than on a very small scale. Because in a way, I mean, I've thought this before with large paintings, but when you work on this scale, it's a whole other cup of tea of, you know, I always think of it as your left hand doesn't know what your right hand is doing. You've got to make it all work in the end, but that you really can get very involved with one area of the painting and it can be a completely different kettle of fish on the other side of the painting. Um, but in the end, that it, obviously it does have to work as a whole. Um, you know, the interesting thing is it's impossible for me to see these in the studio because I can't get back from them. I can't see them all at once. Um, so it's sort of a lot of hope and guesswork but um but yeah there are certainly passages where you could work on a sort of pa whole passage of it all all day and um completely you know for example another rule has always been you know i'm not allowed to work on paintings if they're wet or even just a bit tacky i one of the reasons i work on a lot of things at once is because once i've worked on something then i'll leave it for two or three days um just start other things but with this, I could totally cheat with that because it was very rare that the whole thing was going to be wet. Actually, we didn't say what size this is. Um, and now I don't know it off the top of my head. No, I have it right here. For anyone who hasn't seen it, it's 30 feet long. Yeah. So you could kind of cheat with that and um, you know, work on whole areas without touching other areas. Um, but just to go back to the triumph of the vanities. I read Bonfire of the Vanities a few years ago, the Tom Wolfe book, which if, any, if you haven't read, it's, it's kind of, it's really, um, 
it's like a portrait of now, even though it's about the 80s. It's talk about all those gross things about Manhattan now. Um, so I had this idea of the, and then this one, the other one looked sort of like a fire, a bonfire, and I was think, kept thinking bonfire of the vanities. And then I'd worked on this one. I've of, often looked at this Mantegna series of paintings, uh, The Triumph of Caesar. You ladies, if you don't know it, um, it's at Hampton Court. And um, a lot of people don't realize these amazing Mantegna paintings, this whole cycle of them are at Hampton Court, this palace in West London. And, um, and there, are passage, there are figures within this that are mm, slightly sort of stolen from the Mantegna. So I, have, I was like, the triumph of something, and the bonfire of the vanities, and eventually I realized it should just be the triumph of the vanities. And also that worked because, um, um, you know, I was thinking about right now, this moment in New York and with greed and greed and vanity and, you know, this sort of end of the world feeling that we all have. Um, and that, you know, the president, um, <laughs> just how, how did we get here, you know? <laughs> But um, I, just, I love the idea of triumph of the vanities. Now I'm working on triumph of death. <laughs> Yikes. Yikes. Uh, when you get up close, there seems to be a split between faces and brush strokes. And, I mean, how do you... You're just doing it. I mean, I don't ever want that to be just brush strokes because... You know, when I make a brush stroke, I'm always trying to think of something specific. Um, not necessarily like the curve of someone's cheek or, or like a pair of glasses. Although in this case, I mean, for example, in this case, the bow ties are a good example of how if you home in on something, like if you are lost and think it's abstract, and then suddenly you'll see a bow tie, it's almost like the image emerges from these sort of figural moments. Um, but so I very rarely think of an, I, I find the figurish, figuration abstraction divide really hard to, I mean, in a way, that's my whole life, is like trying to juggle those two, but also try, I'm in denial about them being anything different from one another, and that most brush marks definitely have something figural in mind, if not figurative, and that um, I, f I find it, I don't want to get corny, but it's not like, I don't know why I'm so scared of using the word the essence of something. But, you know, but if you're painting and you're thinking, well, the sort of, you're trying to get the, well, embed. I love the word embed that you said. So you're trying to sort of, you're thinking about these, uh, all the finery and people jostling each other. I know I was working on these when the whole Me Too thing first broke as well. So I was having figures like grabbing each other and this sort of appearance of finery and, um, you know, people behaving themselves where just under the surface they're actually all groping and grabbing and there's almost a sense of violence and assault going on among all the pretty colors and at the party. So, um, you know, this sort of grabbing and groping and jostling thing. Um, so I think I'm always trying to, when it doesn't work for me is when I sort of lose sight of a, an idea, whether it's just saying, a fur coat being jostled, you know, and then you can just sort of keep, it's almost like keeping returning to a, um, a mental motif to keep me back on track. But often what it is is sort of letting that go enough to let the brush strokes become something else, but also always having that thing to like almost pull myself in, you know, rein myself in so it doesn't just become a bunch of pretty, just pretty strokes that aren't saying anything. Oof. Sorry, I'm giving really long answers. No, 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 it's fascinating. I'm, I'm enjoying it. I, 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 I think the best reason to go to the opera is to see your murals. <laughs> and uh, they were pretty amazing when uh, American Ballet Theater in the spring, it was still light out, and it was great to see them in natural light. So. For your show at Paula Cooper two years ago, you developed one of the great themes of the first half of the 19th century, um, a moment of realism before Impressionism, Jericho, Delacroix. 
What was appealing about working with the storm-tossed boat? Um, I could, I could, I could ask, ask more. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me the storm-tossed boat is a very European theme. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you see yourself as an Anglo-English artist? Oh, gosh. Anglo-American? Yeah. Anglo-English? Um, oh, well, well, I always said Anglo-American. Oh. I mean, that's the sort of thing I think other people can decide, you know, later on or when I'm dead. Because um, <laughs> I don't know if you feel... I feel like a New York artist, I guess, but I definitely feel steeped in... An English history. Um, but the storm tossed boat is something very. I mean, I feel European. I don't know. I think um, I feel like um, a European who left for New York. Like, I feel like. So most of my friends are either English or European, but I realize that I'm friends with the ones who left. Like, I'm not that good friends with English people in England. I'm, there's something about Europeans who leave and come here. Um, but, you know, it's European painting that I looked at the most and what, that's what got me into painting. So, um, I don't know, I think just like the gender, when I was started looking at painting, I wasn't, I don't think you think like that. You're just, you know, you're in the National Gallery or where wherever and there's, in a way, it's a great equalizer, an art museum, isn't it? So you're not really thinking, oh, French paint, you know, you sort of go in and see what makes you, what, what you respond to and, um, I mean, we talked about this in the studio about, you know, wanting to, it sounds so corny to say, have a conversation with. But I do feel like, um, in a way, painting is a way of replying, that you go and look at art and you um, see paintings you love. And it's almost as if it's not really, the, the experience of looking isn't really completed until you've sort of replied. Um, and so, but I do think, I've always been open to everything kind of entering in. But the funny thing is, even though I love people like de Kooning and Twomley, but I didn't really think of myself as having been influenced much by American painting. But when I first started exhibiting here, everyone talked about abstract expressionism. And I thought of myself far more like in a line with Delacroix than de Kooning. Um, and I don't know if I was just in denial for a long time or I prefer Gorky, Gorky but, um, you know, but I think one of the joys about being alive at the end of the 20th century is that it's all there, you know, that you do have in your head, Gorky and Picasso and de Kooning at the same time as Bacon or whoever, but also, you know, the whole history of painting, but then um, new things as well. And the idea, I just always thought, one should look at everything and then you just try and, you figure out what you're interested in by, through painting. Um, but the shipwreck thing, it was quite, um, I mean, anyone who paints know that, knows the biggest fear is like not knowing what to paint or feeling like you don't have a subject. Because as long as you have an idea, I mean, in a way, this is old fashioned, but it doesn't really matter what I'm painting as long as I have an idea and it could be anything, but just anything to spur it on, especially as I do have, I always want that foot in the world, as it were, in, one foot in the visual world. So it can take, so I just looked, I stumbled on that little Delacroix shipwreck. It was just a reproduction, but I knew the painting, but I just hadn't thought of it. And um, as you know, I nearly always draw, when I draw it's almost always from outside sources. Um, and so I just started doing a little copy of the Delacroix and it was one of those moments of like, oh my God, this is an amazing subject um, for lots of reasons, um, but it just, um, I mean, first of all, it was one of those subjects that seemed um, prescient and, you know, even though Delacroix and uh, Jericho, and it's a really old subject, but that at the same time as I was drawing these little shipwrecks from shipwrecks, um, on the front page of the New York Times, there were refugees being rescued and um, in a way it was this way of sort of talking about things that were going on but without making like a copy of a New York Times photograph. So I think I'm always looking for subjects that 
have been around for a while but are also alive. So, you know, um, whether it's a battle or a shipwreck or a, you know, erotica or... A, so I think the shipwreck just hit a nerve and I ended up making... You know, sometimes I'd take something to copy and I think, oh my God, this is amazing, I must work from this. And then I do like two copies and you're like, yeah, it just doesn't take. But the shipwreck really took. And then, you know, three weeks later, that's all I'd done was like copy these uh, Delacroix and, and Jericho's and everything. And um, it, just, it just caught my imagination at a moment. And then once I'd started turning them into paintings, um, I realized that the boat is a really great artistic device. Just the fact that the, you have a boat, the edge of the boat holds in all the action. So I think um, that, you know, one of my problems is it sort of gets too frenetic. So the idea of having a, um, a frame within the painting and the boat provided that frame. But, I mean, I went far away from that. Like here, there's barely a boat left. But even just having that sort of edge along the bottom. Um. It's funny, because I was going to ask about, this gave you the opportunity to use blue. And then I'm yeah. thinking about the Delacroix, and there's no blue in the Delacroix. Right, it's more like turquoise teal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the, the sort of, if you can, this is in three pieces. So if you can see what might be called the central figure, it's a man with his back to us. Um, and he basically comes from there. I mean, then I started copying different Delacroix. There's like three or four Delacroix shipwrecks that I worked from. Um, but that's a perfect example in a way of just needing one thing that sort of anchors it. Uh, excuse the pun. But um, that's so amazing to have, I mean, you're having a conversation with Delacroix. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and in fact, Delacroix actually um, posed for the Jericho. Jericho, you know, Delacroix worked for Jericho, so there's one figure in the Jericho painting that Delacroix actually posed for and Jericho drew him. So I have what I call the Delacroix figure, you know, and in the end, and then this kind of, through all these roundabout ways of presenting it and re-presenting it. You know, it's in my head now, that is Delacroix, <laughs> the guy with his back to us. And I've actually painted lots of men from behind, like nearly every guy I've painted is from behind my whole life. So he fitted, like I love men's backs and I've used men's backs a lot. And so there was this other way that it seemed to fit. You know, a bit like with the Met paintings, it's this feeling of right subject, right time, and that as I say, it's almost just a sort of portal where it opens things up for me. And um, it might not even necessarily be clear to the viewer that this started with a shipwreck. Um, right. But obviously the shipwreck becomes metaphorical and just a way to talk about everything. I'm always looking for things that mean you can talk about everything at once. It's so cinematic. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, my main aim is that my paintings are in constant motion. So this is where you start. Mm -hmm. We're back to 1997, to this untitled painting. And you begin with rabbits. Mm -hmm. Was the, the, the propagation of rabbits the same as the proliferation of painted passages? I mean, it seems to be you like to do multiples. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, it was, you know, the bunnies were just an excuse to paint, really. But um, I, the bunnies were really important to me because I wanted to paint figures very badly, but I didn't want to paint men and women. And so I wasn't that aware of it when I started them. But the bunnies were obviously surrogates for human beings. Um, and again, I mean, and I feel like I overuse the word freedom, but it's almost like everything is like a way to free yourself up or, um, so I feel like I've said this before, but um, the whole rape of the Sabines or massacre of the innocents thing. So, I mean, I always loved these paintings growing, well not growing up, but as a student, um, the paintings I always loved the most were sort of gnarly battles or very dramatic 
uh, scenes of conflict. Um, and I really wanted to kind of make a, a new version, but um, didn't want to use humans. So in a roundabout way, I started using rabbits and then other animals. Um, and this is almost the last one, because by this one, I remember the genitals were getting very human, and the enormous bunny on the right. With the, he's holding a little purple bunny and a little blue bunny. Yeah, and yeah. then just below that, you'll see. And by that point, I thought, I clearly really want to paint humans at this point. So this was really the last bunny painting, and I had to face facts and say, I just need to actually be braver and do it with human beings. And um, but the bunnies have recurred a lot over the years, and I'm painting animals again now, because I just do think animals are a great way to talk about things. You know, for example, they were bunny gang rapes. It's not a very good reproduction, but the whole area that looks very white, there was this little bunny in the middle that I used to call the dish rag bunny, this sort of poor little... But I didn't want to paint a girl bunny being raped, and I didn't want to paint a boy bunny being... You know, I just wanted to, it to be about something violent and horrible, but I needed there to be some sort of humour and, you know... I want the painting to be able to um, hit a lot of notes at once, so it goes from very dramatic to sort of funny and absurd back to classical, you know, and it's that thing that I feel like a painting is capable of hitting many, you know, it's, it's not a movie, it doesn't have a beginning and end. You can come into it at any moment, and so, you know, um, it should be very layered in terms of both imagery and um, emotion, I guess. Not mood. Why are there some words that you're just like, ugh, mood or essence, I just feel. So when you began to paint the figures, was it just easier to use white and pink? <laughs> uh, um, it's just more obvious. Easier than you mean using you uh, that a figure would be white or 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 pink. Um, I mean, yeah, I guess. I mean, I guess um, a lot of them were also trying to play on the white of the canvas, especially around this time. So, a negative space and whether something was positive or negative. So, I played a lot with white on white. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I guess as a white person, I did tend towards white flesh and pink flesh. Um, but, you know, there's often... I mean, that's another reason I like the rabbits, because there was so obviously... It was so obviously not a depiction of a real world that it was a sort of built-in... Um, it was built-in that it was a fiction and it was an artificial place. And I think as soon as I started doing figures, you know, then you've suddenly got to worry about, is it white or what color is it? That you're saying something, when really it's talking about color and space and scale as much as anything else. Well, here we, I mean, it's astonishing how quickly you went to making life-size couples. Mm -hmm. So this is around 2003, I think, or two? Um, and the one you showed before was from like 98. Um, yeah, I mean, this, yeah, 2003. We have this one and we have this one. Mm -hmm. um, but you didn't, you didn't stay with something as naturalistic as, as these. You went back to more with what you were doing with the bunnies. I mean, I always wanted to, always, and still do, like just keep moving the goalposts. So I've never felt like I'm searching for a style or that it's something, you know, I really want to, um, I mean, I think I'm sort of greedy. I don't want to find a way to paint. And in fact, it disturbs me if I feel like I'm, I have found a way to paint. Um, so I think it's all just trying to, especially in the early years when I was exhibiting, like early 2000s, I always wanted each body of work to be quite different from the one before. Um, and in a way, um, I don't know, I, one of the nice things about being a painter at the end of the last century was this feeling that anything's possible, 
you know, and so why would you restrict yourself? And in the same exhibition where those two paintings showed, I had a couple of very abstract paintings hung side by side. And my whole thing back then, um, which I've sort of let go now, but I'd still do a bit, was that every painting in an exhibition should be sort of having an argument with the next painting. And so that you couldn't leave there with a nice, easy, tied up idea of what I was trying to do. And, or, and I think one can't ignore the fact that painting was very, very wrong when I was an art student and in the 90s, that you really felt like you had to defend painting. Um, and certainly, if you were a gestural painter, um, it was even more wrong, or a figurative painter. And so I think there's a certain defensiveness, especially in the early years, of feeling like just as I start doing one thing, I feel like I've got to contradict it and say, you know, so next to this was, um, you know, what I still think of as probably the most abstract painting I've ever done that's, you know, really nothing recognizable in it. Um, I always wanted the paintings to, you know, be in an argument to show that I wasn't saying, this is how you paint a figure, you know, because I feel like that's um, unanswerable. And I mean, I think there are people doing it now that weren't. I don't know. I feel like you have to reinvent things. Um, and I guess I just very much feel like once I've done something, I try and feel like, why do it again? But I love the idea that these are the most, you know, representational images, and they were with the most abstract mm -hmm. images. Yeah. Um, so you saw how that well, went. You know, a lot of things, I felt like. When I did clear figures, I felt like people really got, they felt like they got it too quickly. And in a way, I think the way I have paint um, changed over time because I really wanted to avoid it being a quick reading. So I've always tried to juggle that thing of having something that's very striking as an image and that makes you want to stop and look, but that also can't be easily read and easily digested so that even if you think you've got it at a glance, you actually, maybe in a slightly annoying way, but you can't just walk away that it's, it keeps saying like, no, 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 come back, you haven't seen, you know, and that you walk away and from a different angle it looks completely different. So, you know, in a way, back to that one with the two figures on a bed, um, you know, I think something people don't realize about getting older as an artist, you don't necessarily, like, I'd love to paint that again. I love that painting. <laughs> And I just don't know how to do it now, you know? Like, um, so much of it is done, it sounds overly romantic to say, but of necessity, but, you know, it's so, um, it's really hard to, I think most things are done um, really when you're trying to figure something out. And so there really is this almost sadness, like once you've done that painting, I mean, there'd just be no reason to do another one. Um, not that I think I'd necessarily figured it out, but, you know, I think... Um, I'll give you another 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, yeah, the thing, the way the figure has come and gone, it's partly just to slow things down for the viewer. Well, this, this one is uh, puzzling. It, with, with the title, The Adoration of the Lamb, you, yeah. you just think right away, is this a religious painting? Right. What do you think? <laughs> um, I think it must, it must be based on an adoration of the lamb. Well, no, I was looking at, um, it wasn't Memling, it was someone like that. Cranach or someone, I should know, but it was, I, I was looking at certain paintings of adoration of the lamb. Someone, you, you guys know this. Van Eyck. Van Eyck, thank you. <laughs> so Van Eyck, and um, there's, it was just about the space, so that there's almost a little toy. It feels like there was a sort of um, sculpture or toy on wheels at the front of the painting that really reminded that I kind of got the space from that. Shall I show you? Um, there's this little figure in here. It's almost like a little lamb, like a little lamb sculpture. Um, and I love lambs. 
And, but I'm also not religious, but I mean, I love the idea of worshiping a lamb. Um, and I guess that's the closest I would get to religion is loving, but loving the world and loving animals and nature and so on. But, um, but it was really, I got the sense of space from Van Eyck. And then that was sort of just the beginning of the painting. And you know, I don't title them as I go along. So I didn't think of, oh, I'm painting the Adoration of the Lamb while I was painting it. I just thought I'm painting this weird. I was trying to do, I was trying to combine still life landscape and um, interiors all at the same time with these paintings. Um, and I don't remember why, because it was before I had a kid, but I was also thinking about little toys a lot, like um, little wheel of figurines and things. And, but in a way it was just, I wanted it to be all those things at once because I was trying to make a new kind of space. Oh, I, 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 I totally get it. I, I once gave a lecture in Ghent and the next day I was gonna go somewhere else in, in Belgium, but the Ghent altarpiece was so amazing. I stayed in Ghent and went two days in a row. I mean, I, I get it. I'm intrigued by the purple. Right, well, I think I just want to, like, as I said, with most painting is trying to just get away from the one before. Um, and I just hadn't really ever used purple. And it's so difficult. And it's so hard to do pur a purple painting without it just being really like some horrible album cover or psychedelic. Like, But you know, I've also always tried very hard to go to those places where I'm scared to go. You know, if it seems tacky, even today, like, if something's really bothering me in a painting, I always try and leave it for a few days to see if it's bothering me, because you know that maybe that's exactly the thing I should be keeping. You know, and you have to really watch out for your own taste, like good taste. So, um, you know, I am trying to always put colors together that I've never, I couldn't say never seen together, but um, again, any painter will know. You can do something in the studio that seems really radical to you, which could just be like that purple next to that blue. And um, it's just that's what makes it exciting, is that then the next day you're like, oh, what if that purple were next to that green? And it might look hideous, but it really is. You know, I think the paintings are very color-driven and color-led, so it, it is endless, like the number of colors you can put together. So. I do try and sort of bring in colors I find difficult and move away from colors I think I'm overusing. And, um, you know, a lot of it is just trying to escape whatever I just did. So I think this was just this oddball painting that I included because I really like it and there aren't any others like it. Um, and again, I'm always like, how did I do that? Because I like this one and I don't know what I was really thinking about apart from Van Eyck. I love it. Uh, so now, I mean, this is a fractured image multiplied. I can't even Yeah, figure. I actually included this because I don't like this painting. <laughs> and I thought it would be an interesting one to look at and say, you know. Well, we should, I just, uh, we should give the title, Why Are There People Like Frank in the World? <laughs> Does anyone know where that comes from? Nope. It's actually from Blue Velvet. Um, so why are there people like Frank in the world? Laura, uh, I mean, um, Isabella Rossellini says it. And it's just that, in a way, you know, again, I know I've said this before, but the whole, in a way, I always want to have the good and bad in one place, and that I've always been trying to paint heaven and hell in the same painting, and to have something that's very beautiful, but that's also sort of violent and bad. And, you know, basically a lot of the landscapes and things were all about, in the bunny gang rapes, it's like um, how you can have something that's absolutely unspeakable or like atrocities on the most, on a, on a beautiful day and that, that heaven and hell is basically right here already in, on the world and, um, that you know, a painting seems the perfect place to to put both of them together. So here I see turbulence as a theme. Mm. I mean, there's just so much disorder. <laughs> well, this is loosely um, a temptation of Saint Anthony. 
Um, this one does have a religious title. This is Wake Awake for Night is Flying, um, which I think is from a hymn. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know the Michelangelo uh, little painting he did when he was about 15 of uh, Temptation of St. Anthony, um, and it was a copy of a print. Anyone know? Print. Beginning with S. What's his name? Anyway, my brain is... Shangauer. Thank you. It's a copy of Shangauer. And it's this incredible um, Michelangelo with the... Anthony is in the middle and he's being pulled in every direction by about six demons. And it is quite sort of album covery. It's very, um, you know, very dramatic with these demons and and... But this is almost a perfect example of how something can be from an outside source or after an outside source, but moves a long way away from it. And that I did make drawings from the Michelangelo, but that by the time I got to this, I wasn't looking at the drawing. So I just, I copied it many times and that then when I came to paint, I feel like, so I copy drawings in this idea of sort of internalizing the imagery so that when I come to paint, it's, easy to access in in doing in 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 reading a lot of the catalog essays on your work I was kind of intrigued because you talk about how you make these drawings and it becomes a part of you and it's a little bit like Tiger Woods you know putting you know practicing his golf all the time or or a tennis star just hitting that mm -hmm. ball constantly. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you don't think of that with an artist as much. The practice makes perfect. I mean, the, that's the thinking behind a lot of life drawing, I guess. Um, you know, the idea that, I mean, I drew a lot from the figure when I was a kid. And, I mean, a, like a student. And, um, you know, I do feel that that's very much the basis for most of my work is that I drew so much, I drew the figure so much that it's in a way in my, you know, that I should be able to just be able to do two strokes and it has the sense of a leg or an arm without having to, you know, without me actually having to look at anything. So, yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> when I did the show at the drawing center, the curator there really got into this idea of rehearsal. Um, and I don't think I'd ever really talked about it in that way until that show, but I just realized that that was the best way to describe what I was doing it, be doing. Because with these drawings, I will copy the same thing over and over, and they're not for anything. I don't look at them again. I didn't ever show them until the last couple of years. And, you know, it's really just through the act of copying what you learn from, from doing that, that you do, you know, you you then have the image in, in like your, the library in your head. Because um, I don't actually like looking at stuff when I paint. So, you know, the more information I have taken from before I start, the better. And here we have an arm. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna race ahead to get to. Yeah, what time is it? Uh, uh, 25 up. I mean, here's this amazing triptych um, that I guess this is a matter of your studio. I mean, Joan Mitchell used to talk about that. Okay. Of my studio? Uh, you know, putting together. Uh, oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. 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 There's no room. It's hard to do. I started doing dipsticks and triptychs simply because of space constraints. And this is an astonishing painting. Thanks. Um, from a photograph. Yep. <clears throat> so. So every so often you want to go back to painting a figure, the figures. Um. Yeah, I feel like whenever things go too far into abstraction, um, I really miss having a, a, a definite figure. Um, I mean, I don't really like abstraction that much. Um, in general. <laughs> Um, in other people's work or my own. So, yeah, it, it tends to get abstract without me if I don't pay close attention. So I feel like I'm always trying to pull the figure back into it one way or another. And with these group of paintings, um, they were 
they started from, um, I made this collage from this Jimi Hendrix album cover of Electric Ladyland that was a, um, a photograph of like 13 women. Um, and I didn't really want to make these paintings. I'd started the collage for something in particular. My friend asked me to, he was asking artists to make a work based on an album cover. And again, it's the sort of thing I normally run a mile from, but because I'd always loved this Hendrix album cover, um, which I apologize, I should have provided an image of, yeah. but you just Google Electric Ladyland. And, um, and so I, I spent a week at the, the place where I make prints, Two Palms, and um, did this massive mad photo collage using Electric Ladyland photograph combined with Ang's bathhouse. Because I'd always thought that the Electric Ladyland had so much in common with um, painting. It was like a painting, but also that it reminded me so much of certain paintings of rooms full of naked people. Um, and, and then, you know, I thought it was just going to be this one-off thing, but then I got back in the studio and I just, this image had sort of seared itself into my head. And so I started then drawing the image and it was actually very unusual that I draw from a photograph. I almost always draw from other art. Um, and I just became really fairly obsessed with the image. Um, and it sounds a bit disingenuous, but a lot of it was just how to fit them all on the paper, because it was this really tough exercise of to start with one girl, a woman, and go across the paper and end up in the right place on the other side of the canvas. Um, and I drew them and it was watercolor and gouache and ink and things for a couple of weeks. And then finally I realized, okay, I really should make paintings of these. But I really didn't want to because I thought, in a way, I've always avoided painting female nudes with this idea that there's just enough of them already and we don't really need more. Um, so, and if I had painted naked women, they were always doing something and they were naked men as well. Um, but I just, this image was sort of haunting and I started a whole group of paintings of them. And um, I mean, for, this is one of those moments where these were really important for me and I don't know if anyone else even noticed them, but for me it was this massive big change, partly because of the most radical thing was that they had faces and recognizable faces and that they were sitting still because my figures have always been in motion. Um, but they were quite problematic to paint, partly because I was so seduced by the photographic image that I kind of drew them out fairly quickly. Not drew them, because, I mean, I just painted them, but everyone was kind of in their place fairly early on, which normally everything just keeps moving around so much. Um, so I got very stuck with them for a while and, in fact, left them alone for three or four months. Um, and then, you know, really just wanted to... I had to sort of find out a way to make them become paintings and not just copies of his photograph. Um, but they were incredibly exciting. This is one of those moments, it's a bit like with the shipwrecks that you just think, oh, can't I just paint Ladyland for the rest of my life? <laughs> and you know, really force myself to change the subject. Cause, but ever since these paintings, they've been, the figures haven't really gone away. And again, it's that thing of having painted them over and over and over, they've almost become part of the library of images and that I can use them as needed. Um, like there's a sitting figure I was painting today and she was straight out of, she actually didn't make it into this one. She's usually on the far right as this kind of kneeling figure. And it's almost like plucking these figures, you know, at the right moment when you need them, um, then they're, they're there. Um, but I think one of the reasons I was so into this idea of the crowd and how it, this helped me paint faces because Again, it wasn't that thing of saying this is how to paint a face or this is what a figure looks like, but because there were 10 or 20 of them, you could really approach the figure in many different ways. And, you know, so there could be some faces that are kind of quite corny, like cheesy, photographic, or obviously looking at Monk, or, but somehow I, each one kind of gave me permission to make the next one, that you could have one that was really distorted, but it was next to one that was almost like, um, you know, cartoonish. And so each, which actually happened with the bunnies as well, that you could have a cartoon one next to a toy one, next to a clockwork one, next to a real one, and they kind of all cancel each other out, but also embrace the whole idea that this is all 
an artificial world, um, a sort of reverie. Um, and the whole point is that it's not this world, in a way. So, okay, this is weird because this is a tiny painting. So it's funny that seeing them all the same size, this is about 12, it's not about, it is 12 and a half by 17 inches. Um, so all along, since about 2005 or so, I've been making, or eight, I've been making much, much smaller paintings. Um, and as I said, I do think they're much more difficult in a way. Because with the large ones, they become very performative and your whole body's involved and it's just this very physical thing. And with these, it's a very, very different wrist movement. I paint them sitting down, which, you know, I never usually paint sitting down. Um, and this was a, one of the first... Um, and when I started painting these really small things, I called them the neurotic paintings because they got more and more. It was like the smaller I got, the more and more intense they got. And um, people would immediately, that people saw the small ones, the first thing everyone would say was, are they studies for the larger ones? And I'd be like, no, they're not at all. They're like completely their own thing. And in fact, the smaller ones got more and more gnarly and worked and would go on for like a couple of years. And the bigger ones actually got more open and loose and with less paint on them. <laughs> Um, but again, it's that whole argument thing of just, you know, also just, um, it's challenging to constantly change the size. Um, so this is an extreme from the huge ones, but I try and paint on every, every possible size and scale. And I'm also always changing the proportion. So well, if I get too used to one. a canvas, that's the same scale, but... Vertical. Yeah, but... Um, I think just even changing the scale by adding three inches it really messes with your head. And I think I've, I just always really try and um, make it more difficult in a way. Uh, yeah. That's another small one. And Let's now we're the drawings. Right, so this is um, like ink, uh, gouache and watercolor and pastel. Yeah, I was astonished how much media you have in this. And that's like just ink. What had surprised me about the Bosch and the Hogarth is that these aren't like subjects that, if somebody thinks of Hogarth, this isn't necessarily what they think of. But that's because you know Hogarth well? Yeah, I mean, I've copied from Hogarth probably more than anyone else. Um, yeah, he's like my favorite. Um, and also the best teacher. Like copying a Hogarth, you learn more than, more or less with anyone. His, the compositions are so well constructed. Because um, it's actually funny once you start copying people that you see, like when I was copying that um, Jericho, there was one really badly drawn figure. I had a study for the after the Medusa. And I loved everything about it, but there was this one figure who was so awkwardly done. It was like he flipped him over halfway through. And so it was weird copying. You know, anyone who copies things knows. Sometimes you come across something that's actually obviously not right. So it's a question of do you try and improve on it um, or just copy what's there? Because are you being, how religious do you want to be in terms of copying? And recently I'm actually messing more and not minding as much if it's not exact. Um, but I think I learned so much from copying Hogarth because, and this is Bruegel, like you learn so much from doing this. And I'm really strict, like when I copy this, it's not about what the drawing looks like at the end, it's really about trying to get everything in the right place. So I started with the nuns coming down on the right, but I have this whole like OCD rules about, I'm not allowed to go, I have to work my way around the paper. Um, so. You know, when you get to that bottom nun, then you start with the little beggar boy and you go down, you know, and God forbid you get down to the figures of Carnival and Lent and they're not in the right place and they're usually not in the right place. So then, you know, I'm, I move things around within the drawing, but the, the, the aim is really to be able to start with the nuns and walk, go all the way back round and then the final figure is in the right place in relation to the original figure. And it's just a really, really good way of keeping your eye and brain and um, 
keeping everything tight. And this is like, I don't know about doing scales, but something equivalent to like just really, because I don't do life drawing anymore. So I think that copying is a way of keeping everything really, um, keeping your eye really Honest. sharp. Honest. Yeah. Uh, I think this is the last, and it's, it's this major painting uh, that you have, I think, generously donated to the Louisiana Museum. Um, one of the things that I have been intrigued by is, is you're talking of, about, about some of the subject matter. Let's say, yes, they're storm-tossed boats, but you were also aware of all those people trying to leave Africa, getting caught in the boats, uh, that whole just awful situation. Um, many, many years ago, I thought it was absurd when Seymour Lipton, the sculptor, told me that he used to watch the news and he, was, he would make sculptures that related to disasters. Mm. And yet, you seem very aware of doing this and I'm intrigued that someone else who works on a large scale, um, that Julie Moretu does, does this now also, mm -hmm. that there is this incredible consciousness. I, I think what you have done with this painting is, 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 is heart-rending. In, in, uh, weren't you inspired by a news account about the French beaches? Yeah, but I think it's really tricky because, you know, I am in an ivory tower, basically. I am in Manhattan, I'm safe, I'm warm, I've got a roof over my head, and there are lots of things, you know, you can have the, you can almost, you know, have the radio on all day and, you know, paint, it, you know, you can kind of get yourself riled up. Um, I, I'm always a little bit wary of pinning the work too closely to events. Um, but yeah, it was started by, there, were, there was a whole body of work that relates to that story. It was of a, um, a woman being arrested on the beach for wearing a burkini instead of a bikini, ironically being arrested for not showing enough flesh <laughs> on a beach in France. Um, and there are the cops coming down the beach and this woman who's just ha taking a nap you know, suddenly being surrounded by cops. Um, but that was very much just, again, the sort of spark. Um, you know, it became something, this was also combined with the shipwreck and um, I don't know, I think it's just really, you have to be so aware of the sort of privileged position that I'm in um, that, you know, I think it's, I think, I, it's again, it's one of those things that I feel like other people can talk about around the work, but I don't feel that comfortable taking someone else's disaster or tragedy. I mean, I do it, but I don't necessarily want to talk about it, you know, because yes, of course, I mean, I even remember, I think either California was burning or I think there was a, there was a massive hurricane just before my show with Paula Cooper and you were so aware of people across the country, like, you know, you're painting people in under duress and you're painting disasters and you're painting, but I, I think I want to try and take that, dis get that distance. So it's, you know, a way of talking about now, but in a way I feel like that's one of the reasons I use painting as not documentary. It's, it's talking about things that have been going on for hundreds of years and that, yeah, they are still, going on now, but I mean, I dread to say the human condition, but you know, it's kind of, it's those things that are always the same, um, just if you're alive. Well, but thank you, that's a great place to start. Thank you. <laughs>